Um, I hope you are all here for the Master of Public Health, Nutrition and Dietetics um, Applications Admissions Discussion. We uh, like to try and reach out to dietetic students at this time of year because we know that you've got a lot going on, but that this is the time you're contemplating which programs you might be interested in using to complete your, your uh, credentials and the work that you need to become registered dietitians. Um, as we move forward, trying to make my screen work the way it's supposed to. There we go. I would like to acknowledge that the Dalalana School of Public Health and myself working from my home in the town of Oakville would like to acknowledge the territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, <laughs> the Anishinaabe, Wendat, Huron, and Haudenosaunee Indigenous peoples on which our school and many of us are currently standing. The territory was the dish, uh, the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably care and share, uh, share the resources around the Great Lakes. We would also like to pay our respects to all of our ancestors and present elders. And I'm trying to make sure I can see a few of you. Okay. Now you have joined us today um, to talk about our program, to talk about um, how it can serve you as you prepare to become a dietitian, what is the application process to get into our program, to talk a little bit about the next steps if you are planning to apply, and then to ask a lot of questions. I hope that I won't be talking for more than about the first 15, 20 minutes, and that you'll take over and ask us questions after that. We are joined today by a few of our faculty. So um, you'll see that uh, Eric Ng is part of our uh, team. Hello, Eric. Um, I know that Maria Recupero, who handles our practica um, assignments, she's also here. And I see Tracy Burke, our partner from UHN, who is also present. So if there are questions that are very particular to some of the work that they're doing, um, I may invite them to join me and explain a little further. So let me begin by giving you an overview of the program. The MPH, Nutrition and Dietetics, is um, an actual master's degree. Maybe I should start by introducing myself. I always forget to do that. I'm Pierrette Buchlis. I'm the director of the program. And I always think that everybody knows that somehow. But that's not something you get by osmosis out of this. So I hope that I'm answering everything. Um, okay, so it is a master's degree offered through the School of Graduate Studies at the University of Toronto. And as such, it is offered in partnership with the Dalalana School of Public Health, the University of Toronto Department of Nutritional Sciences, University Health Network for many of our clinical um, experiences and also expertise that contributes to our program development, Compass Group Canada, where again, we have a great deal of experiential work that happens, but also the uh, influence of these uh, people in the field on our, our, um, our curriculum is, is considerable. And Toronto Public Health, who at this point is uh, a little bit more silent because we're still exiting the pandemic and our public health partners are incredibly preoccupied. In order to join our program, you must have a four-year undergraduate degree in a food and nutrition program that is accredited by the Partnership for Dietetic Education and Practice or equivalent. And so what that means is that if you have a different kind of an undergraduate degree, you have a couple of options. Either if you are strongly convinced that you are the equivalent of an accredited undergraduate degree in nutrition, you will need to go to the College of Dietitians of Ontario and get their confirmation that they agree with that. Or you will need to uh, demonstrate proof to us that this is accredited by an agency that the College of Dietitians of Ontario recognizes. Um, and that agency, it, it may be ASCEND, which is the equivalent um, organization in the US. There's also some equivalents recognized with Australia. But as you can see, it's very particular. We are looking for these dietetic undergraduate programs. Many students find that they um, have to think about whether if they're not from strictly a dietetic program, whether they need to go back to such a program and complete any outstanding requirements. At the end of the program, you will have a master's in public health, and also you will be um, uh, seen as completing an accredited dietetic uh, practical training program. 
So you will be re regu blech, ready. It's an evening. I can't even believe how I'm speaking today. You will be ready to apply for registration as a dietitian within um, one of the colleges that regulate the profession of dietetics across the camp or across the country. And our focus is on the development of dietetic experience and practice across a clinical public health model. That may be mysterious to many of you, um, but I invite you, if you're interested in our program, to read up on it. There are publications coming out more and more now describing what that means. But in fact, what we are looking at, um, I think I actually have a picture in the next slide. Yes, I do. Um, we have a philosophy that says there really is a continuum of care happening and dietitians are traveling back and forth across this continuum regularly when they meet the needs of their clients from clinical care to preventive measures to population or public health. And so we're looking at um, the, the needs of the individual and the needs of the population and how those things intersect on a regular basis and what this means for us as uh, health practitioners with a scope of practice and also how we have to cross uh, imaginary lines between some of the social services and the other kinds of environmental concerns that affect any of these areas. So it's an important piece for our students and it's important that anybody who's applying to us demonstrate for us that they're comfortable with this, this approach to learning and practice. Check our chat. Okay, good. Thank you, Eric, for putting in some additional information. Um, our program overview uh, shows what it looks like to participate in our program for the two years that it takes most students to complete. It's not actually quite two years, but as far as the school years are concerned, it covers two academic years. So we begin always in September. And our first term in September is fairly prescribed for the students who enter our program because there are requirements that are fundamental to the Masters of Public Health. And there are requirements that we feel are essential to prepare you to become part of our practicum experiences. And so that is what your first term would look like. And then through the second term and through the summer of that first year, you spend quite a long time in placement. Uh, the equivalent of about six months in placement in all kinds of different rotations across all of the areas of dietetic practice. And in your second year, you come back to campus and you have um, some required courses in both terms, but you also take electives and you're also going to participate in a culminating project which will give you more practical training that is a part of your dietetic practical training, but also help you to really pull together all of the things that you've started to do comfortably in your, your practica. Uh, you may have met competency, but now you're going to go a little bit beyond that in some ways by really feeling the, the experience come together in a, in a formal way. I keep thinking about Okay, so yes, we have a regular, rigorous curriculum, and then this curriculum has um, uh, the participation of researchers that uh, meet the University of Toronto's high standards for teaching at the graduate level, as well as some of our extremely experienced um, counterparts from the field, experts in their own way. And so you're going to have um, hard work and you're going to have high expectations, but at the end of it, you will be feeling very comfortable. You will be doing your practical learning across the whole program. So there isn't a segment of the program that we call the dietetic internship. The whole program is known as a program of practical learning along with the MPH. And so you will be getting that through some of your courses, through definitely those practica, as well as your culminating project in your uh, second year. And through this, you will be prepared to work across any part of dietetic practice. We do not have a particular focus on only one area. There are rumors that we are a public health program. Uh, you certainly get a great exposure to public health or population health issues, but the program trains dietitians who cover all of the um, entry to practice requirements. And our grads work in many different sectors. Um, obviously, public and community health is one of them. But we have many of our graduates who work in hospitals and other clinical settings. Some of our graduates are very interested in government work. Some are working in food management, food provision. 
A lot of people take jobs in not-for-profit or commodity groups. You might say some of them are quasi-industry as well as straight up food industry. Um, we don't have a problem with the idea that there is an important role for dietitians to keep these areas of practice um, up to date, current on what is expected from a nutritional point of view and uh, fair from a regulatory point of view. We have students every year who go on to do academic work beyond the NPH um, and to get involved in research. And then we have some students who are uh, pursuing media communications kind of roles, as well as consulting in private practice roles. So really, the sky's the limit. There isn't anywhere that our graduates are not somehow part of the profession. We have a couple of different ways that you can uh, customize our program. And one of those is through what's called a collaborative specialization. I don't necessarily want to go too deeply into this, except to help tease you that there are ways to make this two-year program really conform to your ideas about where you'd like to work, the kinds of uh, topic areas that are very interesting to you. So the collaborative specializations are something that's offered to all of the MPH students, where you have an opportunity to do a little bit more practical work in a certain area, you have an opportunity to take a little bit of extra coursework in a certain area, and then on your transcript, and of course then afterwards on your, um, your resume, you can talk about having additional training in that area. And some of the areas that our students have expressed interest and have pursued these collaborative specializations include public health policy, um, addictions and mental health, women's health, um, indigenous health, there's all kinds of different opportunities. And again, there are ways for you to become engaged in this once you're accepted into the program. So there are, there are some really interesting um, ways for you to make this program your own. And then further, we've discovered that many of our students who come into our program already have a pretty good idea where they would like to work. And so they're interested in working perhaps in the clinical area or um, they've done some work in the food management, food services, food systems area, and they would like to go a little deeper since they've got two years with us and uh, maybe situate themselves as a little bit more than entry to practice in that area or to establish a better network or track record of experience. And so we've created some emphases. One of them is our clinical nutrition, which is operated in collaboration with our partners at UHN. And it allows students to spend a little more time in their uh, 24 weeks of uh, rotations in clinical areas with UHN dietitians as preceptors, as well as doing a project for their culminating project that is related to UHN's um, above and beyond needs. And they also have the opportunity to uh, take an extra course that would give them a little bit more insight into the clinical world. And then we also have a management and food systems emphasis that's uh, uh, operated in partnership with Compass Group. And you do a little bit of extra work, a little bit of more of your 24 weeks is done in a project um, area with Compass Group to learn the, the food provision side of things, um, the food business side of things in a deeper way. And then you would do a second year project with Compass if you're a part of this emphasis so that you really have some great experience to talk about in an interview. You've got um, some extra networking to do in that area. And additionally, a course um, as one of your electives that would be related to this area. We have on the books a, uh, an emphasis in public health nutrition as well. But again, because right now we're still working through the ends of the pandemic, I hope we are anyway, we haven't been able to offer that for the last couple of years as many of our public health colleagues have been redirected to other activities. If you're looking for more information about the program, you can find it here at our link. Um, this is a way for you to look at some of the um, information I've already shared, to be honest, as well as some additional frequently asked questions about the program. Um, many of the things that you're thinking have probably come up before, and we tried to keep them available to you at all times this way. The application process is as follows. Right now is the application season. Our application portal has been open since mid-October. 
everything is done through the application portal. So you won't be sending documents directly to myself or to any member of our team. You'll be posting them all through the applications portal in a way to make sure that everything is there. Uh, you have a little dashboard so that you know that you've completed all the elements. Your undergraduate degree is, of course, the first thing that we'll be looking for. It must be from an accredited undergraduate program in nutrition and dietetics within the last three years. And again, this is a requirement of the colleges of dietitians. They want to make sure that your um, academic training is up to date. And if it's not from within the last three years, it might be advisable to uh, polish up a little bit um, in some of the areas related to nutrition science, or you may want to go back and explore some of the statistics or something like that, just to make sure that you're feeling like you're ready to take on a, a graduate degree and also to dive into dietetic practice. You would need to upload all of your transcripts from any post-secondary work that you've done into the portal as part of your application. And I'm being very specific about this. So if you've done uh, a certificate in uh, communications that you did a couple of years back, um, that needs to be uploaded into the portal. If you've done a, uh, um, a George Brown College uh, program in chef training, that has to be uploaded into the portal. If you have a prior degree in engineering, that has to be uploaded into the portal, along with the nutrition and dietetics degree that we'll need to see the transcript for. We have a letter of intent. We invite um, anybody who is applying for this program to answer three questions that help us to understand a little more about who you are and what you see in our program that's going to help start your career in the direction that you want to go. We ask for a CV. A resume perhaps is a good way to describe it, but don't make it too brief because we do, again, use this as a way to get to know you as a candidate and to understand some of the context around the jobs that you've held in the past, the perspectives that you'll bring to uh, dietetic training as part of that, um, some of the volunteer work that you've done or any of those kinds of additional background pieces that help us to understand our, our candidates as they start with us. You also have to supply two reference letters. And those two reference letters do not need to be academic references. They need to be people who know you well and can speak to how you would be an asset to the profession and how you're going to be a successful candidate in graduate school. So academic references are not necessary. Certainly, if you have a professor who knows you well enough to speak to that, we'd be happy to hear from them. But if you instead would like to submit two professional references, that would be okay as well. The deadline for this material to be submitted to us is January the 18th. So you still have some time, um, but know that uh, it's important to get everything submitted by that date and your application fee paid. If your references take a little bit of extra time, that's okay. There is a little bit of wiggle room. But if we haven't got your references by January the 18th, if that's not appearing as complete on your application, you may want to make sure that they are um, aware and are, are working on it so that all of that material can be handled, uh, reviewed, and considered complete in short order so that we can begin our process. And the next steps fall into our lap, and we will be reviewing those applications in early February. And we will be having in-person, I should, it's not in-person anymore, I'm sorry, I've left that from a previous slide set. It's going to actually be um, online interviews. We've been finding that those are very effective for not having people running down the 401 between various dietetic programs that take them through the next step of their of their world. So we're no longer doing in-person interviews, but we will be scheduling our online interviews for the end of February. And we will be communicating to successful applicants by early March. And this is approximately the same timing as most of the other dietetics um, programs for practical training in the area. So you get started by finding your way into the portal. And the best way to do that is to go to the Donald Lewis Public Health homepage and find the link below so that you can get um, to create an application, to um, begin to upload the relevant documents, and to ensure that you're ready for January the 18th. I see a couple of things in the chat. Let me just check on those. Okay, I. I see those questions are being answered, but we're going to be ready to take questions in just a moment. 
because that's the next slide. So on this note, I'm going to go back to a fuller, I'm not gonna share anymore, but I wanna see you guys so that if you'd like to put up a hand or if you'd like to uh, put your camera on, we can answer questions that might come up. Thanks, Tracy. Okay, Olivia. Hi, I just had another question about the references. Um, are the references to submit their letters to our online portal or are they supposed to submit it to an email? They are given a link and they have to go, once you submit their names with an email that they would look at regularly, they mm. will be sent a link and they go to that link and enter the information there. And there is a sort of a checklist quiz that they have to go through. And then there's an opportunity for them to provide a, a text response to why they think that you'd be a good candidate. Okay, and they'll receive this link once we submit our application, is that correct? So as soon as you submit their names, as potential references, the link okay. will be sent out to them. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, I just have a follow-up question to the confirmation of completion of the academic program of like the dietetic courses, the PDEP required ones. Uh, do we need to submit a confirmation of com completion from the university or do you guys check it on our transcripts? Well, the first thing that happens is we receive the transcript that's part of the application process. You'll need to send us an in-progress uh, transcript right now. It doesn't need to be an official transcript, but it does need to cover what's been done in your program up till now and when you're expected to complete. Um, so it'll show us the courses that you're doing this year. If after the process, you are one of the candidates who is coming to us in September, you will need to submit another transcript that is an official transcript that shows that you have completed the program that we're expecting to see you complete. So before you are fully registered in the program in September, we would need to have on file the official transcript that shows you successfully completed the undergraduate program we needed. Okay, sounds good, thanks. I think you might be on mute, do you? Yeah, there we go. Hi, uh, sorry about that. I just have a follow-up question about recording um, previous academic training. So um, I had some training from a different province in the East Coast, and it is a um, private college. Um, so I actually contacted U of T and I asked them about uploading this transcript and they told me that I didn't need to because it is a private college and I'm just wondering if that is accurate information. Okay Eric is that something that you might have run into so far? I usually advise people to err on the side of caution and upload a transcript of any type that is a post-secondary transcript and I see Eric's nodding his head. Um, it, it, it may not be that important, but if you have a transcript and you can share it, it would probably stop anybody from asking questions if it appears somewhere else in your record and we don't have that information. Okay, thank you very much. Eric, did you want to share something? Yeah, I would say if, if there isn't a system in which you share, uh, I know with the public uh, universities, they have online process where they share transcript and things like that. But uh, for you, I think if you have a PDF of uh, your transcript, that's probably the best thing to do. Uh, and I agree with Brett about uh, just being safe and, and so it's being safe and including as much as you can. So if you think that it is, an, um, if it's a post-secondary institution in some way, then it's probably useful to have include it uh, as a PDF. Okay, thanks for clearing that up. I have a couple of questions from the chat that I'd like to address. So Natalie would like me to explain a little bit more about the culminating project, and I'd be happy to do that. But uh, Yin Ensign has asked if we include the transcript from first year to fourth or fifth year. Um, yes, so the transcript that you'll need to send to us with your application is all work done in your dietetic program up to now that you're working on currently. So if you're um, in a fifth year and you're taking a few extra courses um, that you wanted to add to your, your background, um, that needs to be a part of the transcript that we see. 
they'll be shown as incomplete or in progress, whatever the notation is, but that would be part of the transcript we would be looking for. And I don't know if Eric wants to clarify, he's just nodding, so I'm gonna go with that. Um, and so for Natalie, the culminating project. So this is a, a reasonably new um, course that we have in our second year, but it's been really interesting and very effective from the reports that we've had from the students who've been involved. What we do and what we're hoping, it'll become more that as you're working through your placements, you'll start to realize there are areas that you want to dive into more deeply when you are um, you're finished the placement. Certainly, if you're working with Compass or if you're working with UHN, they have a list of projects that the group that is working with them will be assigned to um, come the second year. But for the rest of everybody, um, I get all kinds of project ideas from all kinds of people who have been working with us for um, some length of time as preceptors, or perhaps they've done guest lectures with us and they think that our students could um, really engage with some of the material that they have. And these are real world projects, things that people would love to get done, but they may find that they only have two hands, not the eight that they need to get everything done. Or um, there are projects that may not be as high a priority for organizational funding, but they would be really good as a proof of concept for some work that's coming up. Um, there's all kinds of different background as to what these projects are about. And the students then do in pairs usually about 300 hours worth of project work on um, a specific issue of real world relevance throughout their second year. And meanwhile, they also take course time with me where we talk about things like operational planning and budgeting and uh, working through um, stakeholder assessments and things like that. So we spend a lot of time making sure that you're very well prepared to take this on and demonstrate a whole bunch of competencies through it. But then the work that you're doing is actually of value to the organization that you're working with. So it's very well received from them. And maybe Tracy, you'd like to say a little something about the project experience you've had. Thanks, Pirette, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I definitely like to share uh, from the UHM perspective. We um, just to echo what Pirette said, uh, we really value the the work that the students do in our organization. And uh, this year, we're we're really looking at addressing malnutrition within the organization. And so we have students working on different projects that fall under that umbrella. So uh, some of them are looking at um, uh, you know, how, the use of the uh, CNST malnutrition screening tool and um, helping to educate to improve uh, knowledge and use of that tool, um, planning, uh, tr planning a, to roll out a training for all dietitians and diet technicians uh, for, to increase their skills in subjective global assessment as part of how we're addressing malnutrition. Uh, we have one group developing a fasting protocol for the uh, ICU. And, and then we have another group that's looking at reporting of meal completion as a way of uh, screening for malnutrition as well. So really important quality improvement work happening throughout the organization that students are involved with. Thanks. The other thing I really like about this is sometimes when you're in a rotation of just a few weeks, you don't really have a chance to see how something starts gets together and then the results that it achieves. And having the full year from September through to March, where you're working with an organization on something you're seeing and contributing to the development of how it will be implemented, then you're launching something and oftentimes you're uh, gathering some data about what effectiveness you're seeing in early days for whatever it is, a communications tool, a new education program, uh, a best practice, um, a standard operating procedure. There's all kinds of things that people are involved with you're able to feel a sense of accomplishment out of that work and then also have some really good examples to talk about when you go out to uh, apply for jobs in the area that hopefully is very interesting to you um, and they ask you so tell us about a time when you you have a time you have a really good time that you can refer back to now, i did see a question from somebody about the um, practicum placements um, uh, we'll get to you in a minute. Um, the practicum placements are not yours to secure. Um, Maria, would you like to talk a little bit about the way that you interact with students to get the placements they need? 
Yes, sure. Thanks, Pirette. And hi, everyone. I, I, this is where um, I like working with the students. So if you have interests um, in an organization, then you, know, you can bring that to my attention and I will work with that information to help secure a placement that you know, both satisfies your interests needs um, as well as the requirements for dietetic practice. In the summer, without going into too much detail, but basically what I do is in the summertime, I will um, meet with every student individually to ask you about your preferences, interests, and, um, and then I use that information to, to find the placements for you. So just to recap, Maria is our practicum manager and she does a lot of work to maintain strong relationships with a variety of different sectors and um, preceptors who will be able to support you in all of those sectors. And you don't have to go out and find your own placements. If you're in our program, we are definitely helping you to identify the areas that would give you the right kind of learning experience and then securing the placements for you in a way that fits together, in a way that covers all of your needs. And so through agencies that the University of Toronto has all of the paperwork and legal requirements and, and so forth covered so that that's not going to get in your way as we're trying to have you, um, you know, spend your time focused on learning. I'm sure there's gonna be more questions about that after because it's always a bit of an open um, area. Jitin asked if, I'm hoping I'm saying your names right. I really apologize. I've got one of those names too. If, if um, if, if I say it wrong, um, teach me and I'll, I'll do better. Um, asked about the public health emphasis and the public health nutrition emphasis is, uh, thank you, is very um, important to us, obviously, but we have to make sure that there's capacity in any of the agencies that we work closely with to provide the kinds of experiences you need to have to do an emphasis. And up till now, we have not, with the public health departments that are close to us, especially Toronto Public Health, um, there's still many, many fires being fought around COVID and the pandemic, and then some of the other opportunistic respiratory infections that are, are causing havoc. So for now, we can't promise that that one will be available. Having said that, um, you're coming to us in a program that is a master's of public health, you obviously know that we have relationships with a variety of stakeholders in the public health area, and we would certainly be able to support um, a good deep learning process in that area if that's something that appeals to you. Uh, everybody who comes into our program qualifies as a dietitian through all of the areas that a dietitian must be competent. But with two years to work through this, you have the opportunity to be able to dig deeper into a lot of different areas that might be of interest to you. And so even without emphasis, the collaborative specializations might make it possible for you to get the public health depth that you're looking for. See the chat is a good source of these questions now, so I'm going to go back to that. Um, okay, partnerships or placements for those who want to become sports dietitians. Can we collaborate with other faculties aside from public health? Well, let me start off by saying that um, there isn't a sports dietetics or a sports uh, nutrition specialization at U of T, but there is a physiotherapy program, and they do a lot of work from a sports point of view. And we obviously have um, teams within U of T that are uh, looking for support. And so um, there is actively work being done at the University of Toronto on sports nutrition, as well as sports in general. You're allowed to participate through your electives in courses that relate to other parts of graduate studies at U of T. And as long as you meet your requirements for our program, I have not so far denied a student who's interested in looking at something outside of the Dalalana School of Public Health. Now, Maria, would you like to talk a little bit about any opportunities the students might have to work with a sports dietitian? Yes. So um, as Perrette was saying earlier too, we have partners uh, and partnerships and already agreements that are in place with dietitians that um, do work in sports nutrition. So, you know, these are the contacts that we have. So if there is an interest in that area, these are the folks that I would be reaching out to on your behalf to, to secure those placements. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
just for fun, we have a couple of recent grads, I'm thinking within the last five years, who've ended up working with major Toronto sports teams. So you know it does happen. <laughs> All right, let me see if there's other questions. Okay, one more question from Olivia. Um, how many applicants do we accept into the program each year? Um, that number has bounced around a little bit, but I think we are currently targeting, Eric, tell me if I'm wrong, um, 30 full-time students beginning the program in September. Well, currently, we, that, that's the number for uh, the, the year that we're in, right? So uh, I imagine that uh, that's around the same number we have for next year. Yeah. So it's not a small program, um, and there's quite a lot of diversity among the students who end up working with us for their two years for their Master's of Public Health. Are there other questions? I think our chat is now caught up. Uh, I think there was a question. Uh, yeah, there's. Uh, it's great that we got lots of questions. Yeah. Uh, there's a question about KCAT. Oh, okay. Um, all right. I'd like to know a little bit more about that question. So either uh, could you read it out or can I find it? Uh, so for international candidates are applying to the CDO. Uh, should we submit the KCAT letter result along with our transcripts? Oh, yes. Yes and yes. Um, if you are in a position where you have credentials that uh, you needed to demonstrate currency with that three-year currency, or if you're in a position where you're coming from somewhere else, where you have done your dietetic training work, and that needed to be verified by the College of Dietitians, one of the ways that they sometimes do that is by providing you with an opportunity to write an exam, yay, they're called the KCAT. And if you wrote the KCAT and achieved a level one result, we would be very interested in seeing your application for our program, but you need to include the KCAT result letter along with your transcripts because that effectively functions like another one of the transcripts. Um, if you did not get a KCAT uh, direction, you were told that you needed a credential assessment, then we would wanna see the results of that credential assessment as being substantially equivalent to, um, that's the wording that they generally use, and there would be documentation they would have sent you that we would hope you could upload as part of your transcript uploads. Yeah, those documents are very important. Okay, let me just. Okay, and um, so West evaluation is a slightly different thing. Um, I, I that would be a, a more general um, estimation of the equivalence of the degree you have taken to a comparable Canadian degree, but it's not sufficient to give us what we need for you to join our program. So if you've done another uh, international degree in nutrition and dietetics, you may have a WES certification that says it's equivalent to a Canadian undergraduate degree. That might be suitable for applying to medical school, for example, or something else, but we have a very particular set of requirements because the College of Dietitians of Ontario and similarly across Canada expects a very particular set of undergraduate competencies to be met. And so that's why we refer you to the College of Dietitians of Ontario because they have a very robust program for evaluating the, um, the international qualifications. So West may be important if you were applying into the Master of Public Health and Health Promotion, for example, but because we have these other specific requirements, we really do require that the College of Dietitians has had a look at your qualifications, your, your past degree, and they're comfortable that it is similar enough to a Canadian undergraduate degree in the area. Eric, you're ready to say something, I think. Yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, so if, you, if your degree isn't, uh, if, in Canada and you've done the KCAT um, and you're applying to E of T, you do require a proof of English proficiency, English language proficiency. So, so you, you would, um, and there's a list of the uh, different assessments that um, the universities, uh, the grad, School of Graduate Study um, requires. 
Um, so I'll, I'll share that uh, in the link so that you can take a look uh, under international applicant. So um, for the so we need the KCAT for the dietetic preparation piece, but the proof of language proficiency is for U of T. So do you need that for U of T? So um, usually we don't look at English language proficiency because most of our students are coming from the three main universities here in Ontario. So we sort of assume that everybody uh, are in that category. And so I think that's the extra piece that you have to do uh, if you have a, a degree that is um, not in Canada. And there's a list uh, of um, countries that uh, the school listed where if your degree is from these countries, then you would need that additional um, uh, proof of uh, uh, English language proficiency. So I'll put the link uh, in the chat box as well. I hope that's clear. Okay. So because English is the language of instruction here, um, it's important that you're uh, feeling very confident and ready to take on um, that, that language. Um, if the language of instruction at the university you were at internationally is English, our school actually does that screening for us before we get the applications. So they'll know and they'll see those, those notes that if that's the way it was, um, they'll let you proceed without any further discussion with us. Um, but they are looking for those kinds of indicators. So for instance, if you've done your, your study in the UK or in the US, um, the language of instruction is recognized as English. And so you're, even though you're an international applicant, you're not required to show uh, proof of English competency. Okay, I saw a couple of questions pop up. Um, okay, so we did have a question about, okay, I think we've talked about English proficiency, but if there's more, let us know. Um, the interview process. And how does the interview process roll out and how is a student successful in that? And Eric, you are the architect of our interview process over the past couple of years. So perhaps you'd like to start with this one. Sorry, I was busy uh, looking at the chat. Um, a bit about our, uh, um, I'm just looking at the question uh, around uh, the interview process. So this, I mean, uh, for, yeah, for, so the last few years we have been interviewing online, uh, which is something that I know many programs are still doing, uh, which is great because it, it's in February in Canada, so it saves us from having to travel in the snow. And of course, we've had a pandemic for a while. So uh, in the, the, the online interview is done um, individually, so it's not a group interview. So you, uh, but it's done in a multiple station kind of format. So um, every about every ten minutes, you also you be, you be speaking with one of the, the four or five interview uh, panelists, uh, and they usually have a question for you, and then so and then you everybody has. Uh, a few minutes to answer those questions and then um, uh, every 10 minutes you kind of music or chair kind of rotate through the different interviewers um, and in terms of what the interview questions usually relates to um, different areas of dietetic knowledge and practice and also um, questions about how you would uh, approach certain situations um, and general, I would say, yeah, knowledge uh, about dietetics, uh, food and nutrition. So, um, and that's, let me see what else I need to say about that. I think that's it for now. Am I missing anything for it? <laughs> I think one of the things that stands out to us is if a student is, um, comfortable enough and conversant enough in the information, the knowledge that they bring from their undergraduate studies, that they're um, ready to answer these questions, that they um, think of the things, multi things sometimes that would relate to that question. And even if you can't give the full answer, it's just to realize that you know where are all of the buttons that you would need to press to be able to um, 
approach a solution from a dietetic point of view. Um, there is always every year a thinking on your feet question, which may or may not be related to dietetic practice. So don't be surprised by it. It's okay to pause and take a thought, but to be able to be conversant and to share your thoughts, um, again, another way for us to get to know you and to start to feel that you're a fit with the program as we think about it. So things like that clinical public health approach or uh, what you know of um, the program and how it relates to the university and those specializations and the emphases and things like this shows that you're really thinking about how this program fits for you. Those are some of the things that um, we would be looking for from the people who did well in the interviews. Um, so I'm going to use that as a segue because there was a question about the difference between the collaborative specialization and the emphasis. And the, the easiest way to say it is that the collaborative specializations are offered university wide. So you would be taking that, um, if you will, it's almost like a minor in an area um, where there would be a multitude of students from different kinds of, of uh, graduate programs learning together about something, whatever that something is. So perhaps it's community development, perhaps it's global health. And you may be in the course with students from anthropology and students from nursing and students from medicine. Um, you may be um, you know, involved in, in uh, courses that would take you really outside of the health stream altogether in some cases. So it is definitely university-wide. It is um, a, a subspecialty that um, usually it has a, a, an application process that you have to apply to, and you would be working with collaborators from all kinds of different backgrounds. In the emphasis, it is very particular to the nutrition and dietetics MPH. And it's a way for our students to express areas of dietetic practice that they would like to dive deeper into. And so it is more focused on the traditional areas of dietetic practice, um, but in different in different ways. So for instance, we have people who are doing a little bit of both, who might be doing um, clinical nutrition emphasis, but have a collaborative specialization in women's health and are interested in focusing on some of those issues. Or um, students who are uh, maybe working in the food, um, food nutrition, um, the food management area of things with Compass, and they're doing a collaborative specialization in an area that may focus on community development or something where they're bringing some of these thoughts together. So there's, um, there is a distinction. I want you to know that both of those things have requirements and our program is already fairly heavily laden with requirements. And so sometimes it can be tricky to match up levels of requirement, first for your specific MPH, then for your emphasis if you're interested, and then for a collaborative specialization. So it requires a lot of extra thinking and a little less degree of freedom around some of your electives. And we should probably, if you are interested in that, start talking about it early in the, um, the process of your um, admission and planning for your first year so that everything can be lined up um, in a way that allows you to complete all the requirements in a timely way. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, um, any other questions? We have just a few minutes left if there are. Philemon. Hi again. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing. So uh, previous applicants, they filled out like a, a undergraduate statistics course form. And would that still be required or again? If you have completed an undergraduate program in nutrition and dietetics that is yeah. um, approved through the Canadian accreditation body or the American, you have included a statistics course. So we don't ask for that separately. For some of the other MPH programs, they ask that you demonstrate that separately. Okay. So we, uh, because our very particular requirement for the undergraduate program already includes it, we don't need you to fill in that attestation form. Okay, thanks. Rihanna.
if you have a question, you're going to, yeah, microphone. Uh, yes. Um, so I know that international students who complete a four year university um, in an accredited dietetics program in Canada don't have to prove for English uh, proficiency. Is that right? Say that one again for me. So international students who complete a four year dietetics professions, um, dietetics program in Canada, do they have to um, send in English proficiency? No, no, because okay, it is, is understood there... that if your undergraduate degree language of uh, completion was English, that that is sufficient. Okay, and there's no required letter of like proving I need to, like, cause like other programs, they require like my school to do a letter of explanation of the reason why I don't need. So does U of T need one letter like that? Okay, I'm not absolutely confident about that. I know that it's one of the steps that U of T is a very big place. And so we see the applications after they've already gone through a certain level of screening for completion at our graduate office. Um, Eric, do you know the answer to that question? Will the graduate office be looking for it if they see the University of Guelph, for example, as the undergraduate university on the, the application? Um, I think it depends on the program you're applying to. So if you're applying to our program and if you have a degree from one of the accredited program in Canada, then we do not require you to provide additional kind of uh, uh, additional documentation that uh, you've met the English requirement. So, um, if your degree is, if you have a, so if you have a degree from Guelph or or TMU or Russia or any of the PDAP or Canadian, so Canadian uh, dietetic programs that are accredited in Canada, uh, undergraduate anyway. So then, yeah. So we don't need extra. We don't need extra stuff for that. But that's just our program. As Perret just said, because we have that dietetic education requirement, uh, that might not be the case for another program. So if you're applying for a different MPH at the same time, they might have different, they might ask for different things. So, uh, but uh, for our program, uh, you'll be fine. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Because we're, we do get to, we do see, uh, it does funnel down to us. So we, we will know if, uh, if there's an issue, we, we will know about it. Okay, so Rihanna and Yin Anson, you were asking a question among yourselves and I can't find the original question. Um, can you let me know what you were thinking about with respect to if some students decide to take one more semester? If either of you wanna share a little bit more about what that question was about. Well, I'll try and address it um, based on just circumstantial evidence of what you might be asking. I hope I get this right. Uh, we have students who are um, not finished their degree in March when um, many students are completed their degrees. Some of our students who apply to our program are intending to finish their degree by August. So they're taking an additional course um, over the summer or there's uh, additional research that they're still participating in that hasn't finished. There's different reasons why. And that's okay. Um, as long as we know that you're at the point where at the end of August, you would have completed all the requirements of the undergraduate program in nutrition and dietetics that we accept, then you can still be admitted to our program but we would need to see as soon as possible a transcript that shows you finished everything by the end of August. So um, that's the one stipulation. If that's what you mean by an extra semester, um, if you're thinking about the situation where a student has finished their degree um, or maybe they finished it, maybe they came back for a little bit more work uh, the following year, they wanted to try a couple of additional courses or they wanna see if they could improve their marks in some way. We still accept those applicants, of course. We would still like to see what work is in progress, even though you may um, already have finished your degree if you're doing a few extra um, credits afterwards. It's, it's just, again, part of the process that we need to have all the transcripts and we need to know when you're truly finished and ready to join our program.
hope I got that. We have about two minutes left. If anybody has another question, now's the time. And I've been looking at one page mostly, but I'm just waiting to see if there's anybody else on the second page that, no, no hands up. Okay, well, with that then, I'm going to call our session to a close and thank you all. Oh, yes. Yes, you can submit an unofficial transcript for the purpose of the application. By the time you are given the letter that you are offered a place in our program and you accept it, you will be told that you must send in an official transcript by the time you're supposed to start the program in September. So uh, our school will need to have your official transcript on file before you can actually begin the program. But for the purpose of applying and for being considered and being made an offer, yes, an, official, an unofficial transcript is okay. Got that one in there under the line. Okay, thank you so much to all of you for taking time at the end of your day and um, thinking about our program. Uh, hopefully that this has been a, an informative um, hour with us and we will be saving this. I will stop the recording any second and we will make sure that it's up for you somewhere. We don't quite know yet, but we know how to reach you all. So once we have a link to that, we'll make sure that it's shared. Thank you very much and good luck in your planning for your next steps.